Hi, really quickly before this video begins, I just want to let you guys know I have another channel. I've been uploading there all year. There's a bunch of videos you can go and watch right now. Go see if you like them. They're just me being me. So subscribe if you like that <laughs> and don't if you don't like that. Oh, and subscribe to this channel and like this video too. I'll just get that out the way now so we can start the actual video and just have a good time. <laughs> All right, whatever, let's go. You see this over here? It's the eShop. Load it up on my Nintendo Switch. 2,500. That's roughly how many games are on Nintendo Switch right now. But let's be real. Most of those are absolutely awful. However, that doesn't mean there isn't hundreds and hundreds of really fun games on the console. The question becomes, how the heck do you find them? I How's it going? My name's Wood, and in this video, I'm taking 10 games on the eShop, highlighting them, and giving you a reason to possibly buy them. If you didn't know, this is a thing that I just do. I think this video right here is actually episode 20, which means for you mathematicians and everyone playing along at home, today's video will take the total of eShop games I've reviewed on this channel up to 200. Two, 200. All right, whatever. Thanks for being here. I do really appreciate you watching. Let's go. The first game that I plucked out of the eShop is Roomba First Blood. That's not it. There's no way I could randomly land on it. That would be impressive. Sometimes games just sell themselves and Roomba First Blood had me interested on its name alone and had me hooked after I played the first level. I mean, look, you play as an overprotective Roomba that can't stand idly by while his house is being broken into. You dash to the kitchen, suck up a knife and equip it to your face and start stabbing, dropping fans and exploding windows onto the would-be criminals, but not before cleaning up his dirty footprints and only after sucking up all the leftover blood that admittedly was partially my fault. <laughs> you know, since I drew first blood. But hey, to survive a war, you gotta become a war. Yeah, you, know, you could even say, I'm their worst nightmare. This game blends my two favorite things, killing bad guys and cleaning up the house. I do enjoy some cleaning. Not only can you clean up all the messes around the house like a good automated cleaning robot, but you can also hack into loads of inanimate objects around the house to keep your abode safe and secure. Just make sure anything you break, you also go ahead and clean up after. Oh, and don't leave your kills rotting on the floor either. Clean that guy up. Once defended, you only have a certain amount of time to clean up as much of the evidence as possible. And there's a lot of replay value here in trying to achieve the highest score possible. I'd only five bucks, but also only at about an hour or two long. Roombo is well worth the price, but it's a game that's gonna leave you wanting more because it's awesome and worth five dollars. <laughs> what the heck? Who left a plank of me here? <sighs> Have you ever wanted to play Left 4 Dead on your Switch? <laughs> well, now you can. In Earthfall, which is essentially Left 4 Dead, but instead of zombies, it's aliens. It's pretty much the same thing. Uh, just in case you've never played Left 4 Dead before, that game and this one, coincidentally, are both four-player cooperative shooters. However, as I said, whereas in Valve's version of the game you're hunted by zombies, in Earthfall you are mowing down hordes of aliens. Definitely different games. <laughs> All jokes aside, this game is honestly really solid, with great controls, fun gameplay, and while a lot of corners were definitely cut visually to get it running well on Switch, I'd still say it looks pretty decent. There's a great variety of weapons, explosives, and even barricades for those times you need to hunker down and defend a house from swarms of aliens. And with a 16 chapter campaign and a 5 hour runtime, it's a great game to just blast out some levels with a squad of friends. A huge drawback for me though is that there's no in-game voice chat. So unless you have Discord loaded up, playing online is gonna be a little quiet here. I mean, of course you could use the Nintendo Online app to- <laughs> I'm sorry, I couldn't get through that with a straight face. Next game. I assume I'm not alone in that feeling of going to a fair or theme park and throwing down $10 on the tilter who cares and having like four minutes of crazy intense fun, but then when it's all over, you step off the ride and you check your pockets for your $10 and wonder, where did my money go? As short as it was, you had a fantastic time, but was the $10 really worth the experience? That's pretty much how I feel about 1980X on Switch. A game so beautiful, so exciting, so quality, so action-packed, with such a kick-ass soundtrack, but it's almost over 
as soon as the thing starts. However, in that time alone, you'll punch up dudes in a beautifully animated beat-em-up, blast away at a giant robot in a perfectly built shoot-em-up, rip through the streets in an arcade racer, slash steel in a fast-paced ninja-themed endless runner, defeat some dragons in a dungeon crawler, and experience a gripping story animated gorgeously in a wonderful pixel art style along the way. All that for $10. There is a lot going on within this one game, and they did a fantastic job with each of the genres it tackled in one cohesive story. Here's the thing though, it's almost unfair how short a time we spend in each game. The beat em up and shoot em up ones specifically, but all of these could easily be fleshed out and expanded on so much more. Rather, the entire package of 1980X is over in about an hour, which is far too short, and it's going to turn a lot of you away, I'm sure. For me, though, I go back to that theme park analogy. This game was an action packed thrill ride for a whole hour, and I loved every second of it. It left me wanting so much more, but I'm still happy I at least got to enjoy enjoy the short experience for what it was. I've definitely spent $10 on a lot less and a lot worse. <laughs> so I just hope that somewhere down the line we get an expanded sequel to 1980X because it was really cool for an hour. Uh, I'll be honest, Ultimate Chicken Horse almost completely passed me by. There's a water bottle. I had never even heard of this game until I posted on my Facebook page the other day asking people about their favorite go-to party games on Switch and Anthony suggested this one. So of course, oh, I'm sorry, I mean of course, I checked out the game. That was a terrible joke. Now the game looks like poopy butthole, uh, visually I mean, gameplay wise, and it ended up being action packed, intense, ever changing fun. At the start of each round, you're given a blank canvas, onto which you are to build a level, just easy enough for you to beat, but just hard enough to prevent your opponents from crossing that finish line. You see, you only score a point if you finish the level alone. If you all finish or none of you finish, then none of you are getting any points. But no round ever feels the same as the parts you are given to build with are randomized. But also, you have all these different people's brains creating the most ridiculous platforms, obstacles, and traps they can imagine at the time. While it might look like a budget party game, it's anything but, with quite a bit of content for your money. It also has other game modes, like an online mode, free play, and challenge mode. It's absolutely worth a buy for your next party game night. You know, assuming you have friends. Whoa, Mario! Ooh, Bowser, stop that. Ugh. So, uh, sadly, I was a late bloomer. When it came to watching Jim Henson's The Dark Crystal. It's one of Kim's absolute favorite movies, so we watched it together about a year ago, and it was shortly after that that they announced a Netflix series and a tie-in video game. Both of these things had me worried. As a new fan of the old movie, not wanting to see Jimmy's reputation tarnished, and while I still haven't watched the show, the game ended up being pretty sweet. The Dark Crystal Age of Resistance Tactics is a turn-based tactics game. Who would have guessed? For a game of this nature, you begin playing on relatively small maps, deciding what characters you want to bring to the fight and where to place them. Your characters can also be upgraded in their unique trait using a skill tree, but as you level up, you can unlock other traits for the same character, allowing you to have multiple different jobs active on a single unit, which really opened up the tactical side of the gameplay. And I was honestly surprised at the amount of depth here and the fast, easy to use controls make it really easy to sink a ton of time into the combat. If you're either a fan of Dark Crystal or just a huge fan of tactical games, I don't think you can go wrong here. But if you don't like Dark Crystal and you don't like tactical games, well, f <laughs> you. Pose up! If you're anything like Kim and I, you're probably always looking for a new couch co op game to play with your significant other, friends, or houseplants if you're forever alone. Ha uh ha. -huh.
<laughs> Tools Up might be the fresh experience you've been waiting for. You and up to three friends work together to turn apartments from drab to fab. Early on, you'll be cleaning up mess and laying down carpet. Then as the levels progress, you'll have delivery people dropping off last minute supplies or having to share a bucket when you both need it for different tasks. If you've played Overcooked before, just switch out the cooking for home restoration and we're looking at pretty much the same thing here. Frantically timed gameplay with levels that you'll reset about a hundred times before you're finally satisfied with your efforts, you and your friends trying to not get passively aggressively mad as you block each other's characters and accidentally use each other's materials and controls so clunky and awkward you can't tell if it's intentional or just bad game design. But for all the comparisons I just made, tools up just doesn't match up to Overcooked. If Overcooked is a deliciously cooked cheeseburger, then Tools Up is a messy unfinished apartment. It's a game that's worth its $20 price purely for the hilarious party fun that can be had, or for anyone looking to expand their multiplayer party night library, if you already have Overcooked. Otherwise, get that first and then dive into Tools Up later on. This is a transition. Stranger's Wrath is a first person slash third person hybrid action adventure game that was originally released back in 2005 on the original Xbox. And I would have to say this is the second best port of the game I've seen, with the Ouya port being number one. This game was on Ouya. <laughs> You play as a bounty hunter named Stranger. But sadly, this bounty hunter doesn't have a cute little adorable baby Yoda to take care of, but he does have these weird terrifying creatures instead. Now, I'm used to my Oddworld games looking a little something like this. So all of a sudden roaming around hunting for creatures and then slamming those creatures onto your crossbow and using them to hunt for even bigger bounties is a pretty huge departure from the original games. You pick up bounties in town and then you head out and you track them down, always finding new ways to immobilize each and every one. Also, you can decide whether you want to finish them off or capture the bounties you hunt, which will affect how many Benjamins you cash in for later on. Now, about that hybrid part, the game is played in third person with the platforming and even stealth parts, but then when you want to shoot, it switches into a first person mode. I figured this would be disorientating, but honestly, you get used to it pretty quickly. The game as a whole is fun and holds up pretty well, so I would say if you loved this game back in the day and have a hankering to dive back into some more bounty hunting, then this HD remaster should scratch that itch and it's worth every penny. If you're currently in North America, that's most of my audience. Hi. All these games can get so expensive, I know, but I got you guys. Squidlet is $2. It's like a McDouble. Or you could be smart and buy a video game. In Squidlet, you play as a squid, and that's pretty lit. I'll show myself out. This little indie platformer attempts to recapture the look, sound, and feel of the original Game Boy, and it nails it perfectly in my opinion. Even down to the charming border around the gameplay that blasts doots while you play. You have a double jump that also acts as your attack as you ink the enemies below you. You'll find a lot of platforming and exploration here as well, and NPCs to talk to, and even the occasional dialogue choice. The gameplay shakes up from time to time, with boss battles ranging from mid-air shooter battles to a magic book that you have to jump inside of mid-battle to ink out the words inside. For its price, Squidlet offers a quaint, polished little adventure with some unique concepts. Well, all that sounds great, but what's the catch, you might be asking? Well... <laughs> You can finish the entire game in like 30 minutes and it presents little to no challenge whatsoever, but forget about that because you could buy the game for the same price as two Frosties at Wendy's. And look at this little guy. Aww, so cute. If you're currently in India, hi. Florence is an Aussie, 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 oi, oi, oi developed game, so you know I had to represent. If the art style alone isn't appealing to you, then you might have something wrong with your dum dum brain. But I'll play along, you dum dum. How about this music? Does that doing anything for you? You idiot. <laughs> if this still isn't doing anything for you, then, then I'll just speak slower, I guess. Florence was originally released on mobile back in 2018. But before y'all start groaning, it was extremely well received, with the game being compared to the WarioWare series from Nintendo. You play as Florence, a 25-year-old lady who lives alone and is very much settled in her day-to-day -day routine of working at her job and vegging out on Reddit posts all day long. The story is told through beautifully hand-drawn art, and and it's 
that's really well animated. You get to interact with all her daily activities, from brushing her teeth to eating sushi, and that might sound a tad monotonous, but these quick little mini games have a similar joyful feeling as the mini games in the before mentioned WarriorWare series. You never know what you're going to need to do next, and each one is so short that it never outstays its welcome. However, it's the storytelling that really shines here, with the mini games merely acting as your way of communicating with the game and its world. During conversations with other characters, you may need to piece together a conversation bubble or dramatically fill boxes during an argument. I became far too emotionally invested with Florence and her relationships during my short playthrough, and it ended up being a really nice little story that was well worth me experiencing for just a few dollars. This is fun, I'm gonna do it one more time. If you're currently in... North America again? Well, let's be specific. What am I pointing to? Oh, that's pretty much Portland. Hi, Portland. You guys are weird. If I told you the next game was inspired by both Secret of Mana and the Goonies, would I need to tell you the name of the game or would you already be finding it a way to download it somehow? Knights and Bikes, which is a really good name for anything, really. A game, a TV show, a movie. My new band name called it. I can't be in a band, I have no talents. Anyway, Knights and Bikes is a co-op action adventure game directed by Rex Crowey, probably pronouncing that wrong, who also made Tearaway. And you can see a similar visual style used here as well as a similar emotion evoking story. The game exceeds in its overwhelming, breathtaking art style Style, and I loved exploring every new area in the game. Set in the 1980s, this coming of age story has you brawling creatures, solving puzzles, and customizing your bicycles with the coolest accessories around. You gain new attack skills as you play, like water bomb throwing and puddle splashing, and you're even able to combine attacks between the two characters for bigger combos. Altogether, Knights and Bikes is a charming, heartwarming story about two friends going on an adventure together, and that's just the best way to play this game too, with a friend or just someone else. The adventure is tailored for two players, and while you can play solo and switch between the characters, it's a much better experience if you bring someone else along for the ride. Well, there you go. Another 10 games, and the first 10 for the year. What did you think of them? Have you played any of them? Do you like them? Are you gonna get any of them? And which ones do you want me to talk about next time? You can let me know all that down below. Remember as well about my other channel. Go go check it out, maybe if you want. If you haven't already, get flipped on that subscribe button or hit the like button. I'd appreciate if you did those things too. I know that this year on Switch is looking a little... We don't know what's going on, but there is still this huge backlog catalog of games, like 2,500 as I said, to keep us entertained in the meantime. And that's why I really like the Switch. Okay, bye!